Well, I've said it before and I'll say it again. America's best days are yet to come. This is Reaganism, a podcast dedicated to exploring where the Reagan movement lives today. I'm Roger Zak. I'm your host, director of the Ronald Reagan Institute in Washington, D.C. Welcome back. This week, we'll be continuing our Reagan National Defense Forum deep dive with former State Department spokeswoman and RNDF Live host Morgan Ortegas. During her time at RNDF, Morgan met with panelists which include policymakers, industrial titans, and Department of Defense officials on how the United States can lead the world in an era of increasingly complex challenges. To watch the panels in their entirety or to watch more episodes of Reaganism, visit youtube.com slash Reagan Foundation. Morgan Ortegas, welcome to Reaganism. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Well, we're, we're thrilled to have you here. Uh, you're known to many because you are the mm-hmm. spokesperson at the U.S. Department of State under Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Uh, you've been in government before that as well, veteran of Bush 43 administration, and also um, a reservist in the U.S. Navy Reserve. Uh, so serving the military side. Probably many of our listeners and viewers know you too from your regular appearances on Fox. But this, I think was your first Reagan National Defense Forum. We've had eight of those, so clearly we've messed up not having you attend earlier. Uh, and no, I have. This is my oh, third okay. one, I think. I've been to the at third. least... Okay. At le- I, yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm part of the Cool Kids Club, Roger. <laughs> and also, by the way, I worked for President Obama too, first term. Tell us about that. What were you doing for Obama? You are in the Treasury or...? I was in the Treasury. I was career, you know, a person, um, intelligence analyst, and I got sent out to be the deputy Treasury attache based in Saudi, and we covered um, the Gulf. So it was actually fascinating. It was during uh, the, um, we got Osama bin Laden while I was on tour there, and uh, the Arab Spring uh, started, and Tunisia, Egypt, and erupted around the Middle East. So it was definitely a fascinating time to be there. Wow. Yeah, that's um, those yeah. are heady times in the Middle East, although I guess it continues to be. I know you do a lot of work focusing on the Middle East, particularly with Iran's nuclear program, which we can get to. Yeah. But first, because it's our Reagan yeah. National Defense Forum special, and, and for those listeners and viewers who may not be familiar, RNDF, as we like to call it, is an annual event out of the Reagan Foundation in California, the mothership of the Reagan Institute, where we bring together all the leaders of the national defense community from those in the world of business to the leaders in the Pentagon with people, stars in their shoulders and members of Congress. And Morgan, you were kind enough to start something new for us called RNDF Live, where you had almost your own opportunity to engage directly with some of the most important voices at the Reagan National Defense Forum. Give us a little feel for what you were doing out there on the campus of the Reagan Library. Well, first of all, there's no better campus to walk around than the Reagan Library. And so if anyone hasn't had the chance to go and you're listening or watching, please put it on your bucket list. It is absolutely gorgeous. Um, And it's just so inspiring to see uh, so many things of the history of Ronald Reagan and everything that he accomplished. I I always leave the Reagan Library feeling motivated and inspired um, and and just relaxed because it's so beautiful. It's hard not to love. So everyone should go. Um, So there's my pitch on the Reagan library. So what we were trying to do, and I think it was a lot of fun, is trying to interact with more social media users, uh, especially the people who can't make it out to the forum, but to give them access to the top level speakers and what's going on behind the scenes. And listen, it was great for me because, uh, you know, I could be on a panel, moderate a panel, which is always fun and interesting. And I do at many conferences, but I felt like I had the best gig this year because instead of moderating one panel or one discussion, uh, I was able to have discussions with many of the top leaders um, there at the at the Reagan Defense Forum. And so we tried to keep it um, uh, easy for you to watch. We would love your would love your feedback. And of course, we hope to make this something ongoing where if you can't make the Reagan Forum, you feel like you can get the same access to the world class uh, leadership that we have at the forum. A great summary. And yeah, those who want to take a look at all of uh, yeah. Morgan's work on uh, RNDF Live, you can go to at Reagan Institute on Twitter or uh, you can go to youtube.com at Reagan Foundation and see them. I mean, you did talk to a bunch of people. We'll get to a couple of them. <laughs> yeah. but Brad Smith, president of Microsoft, General yeah. Paul Nakasone, the director of NSA and, and Cyber Command, um, in addition to, you know, congressmen and others. The, the one I want to start with uh, to get your take on is she's been with us a few times, Senator Joni Ernst of Iowa. She yeah. sits on the Senate Armed Services Committee. She was on a panel looking at and responding to the Reagan National Defense Survey. 
And she was really emphasizing the importance of American leadership in the world and you know, had a critique of the Biden administration along the way. What was your um, kind of take on Joni? And then we'll listen to a clip here in just a second. But give me your give me your take on your conversation with Senator Ernst. Well, I think she's one of our, the smartest and most savvy leaders that we have in the Senate. Uh, I think, given her own experience um, as an officer in the Army, you know, she has just been front and center on issues that are incredibly important to our troops um, and to their families. And I think she's a very clear voice in the Senate. You know, she may not be the one that's uh, always on the, you know, on primetime cable screaming the loudest, but when she does talk, I think it's it's when she does talk, it's important, it's necessary, it's something that we all need to listen to and adhere. And and I find her to be um, incredibly thoughtful. You know, she really digests an issue um, when when someone is bringing bringing it up, and especially in the defense space, you've got the rare um, ability to have a center with a lot of really recent direct experience. You know, in the army, um, but at the same time, you have someone who's obviously very, very smart and thoughtful, um, and is not going to make a gut reaction, but is really going to think through uh, the issues. And so, I, I think we're really, really lucky to be able. Well, to let, let's her. take a listen to your conversation if we can yeah. go to that clip sure. here. Things that is on everyone's mind continues to be Afghanistan. And in the poll that the Reagan Institute uh, surveyed, Americans seem to be almost unsure, unsure about what America's place should be in the world. So I'd love for you to answer that. What should our place be in the world? And how do we convince people to believe in that mission? Yes, the United States should always be a global leader. And we had a small number of troops in Afghanistan trying to stabilize what is a very dangerous country, but it was necessary. And so as America, we need to do a better job at explaining why our military is where they are. And I think the American people would be much more supportive. But I do think it's important that we engage where we can, but not just militarily. Also, we need to use diplomatic pressures, economic pressures, in order to tame some of the nefarious activities that are coming out of countries like Afghanistan. So uh, we, we heard a reference Afghanistan, and mm -hmm. it came up a number of times throughout the forum. Talking to Senator Ernst and more broadly, mm -hmm. Morgan, because you've been thoughtful and, and, and articulate on this issue, how is the Biden administration's withdrawal from Afghanistan really just tragic and, and, and poorly designed and implemented withdrawal mm -hmm. kind of impacted America's standing in the world and, and, and our challenges vis-a-vis -vis China, Russia, and elsewhere? Well, I think it's clearly evident from the survey that all of you did at, at Reagan um, and from just the sentiment of the American people uh, that this is not this is something that the Biden administration wants to go away. Um, but it's not going away because the American people, I think, were genuinely shocked at the images that they saw at, at such a um, hasty and chaotic, unplanned withdrawal. And what's happening is there's in any foreign policy, you know, thing, there's there's issues that are conflated. And so what's happening is people are saying, well, Americans wanted us to get out, right? Your survey talks about this, about the about the number of Americans that did not support an ongoing large troop presence in Afghanistan. Um, and while I think that's accurate, that's actually one of the reasons that the Trump administration under Mike Pompeo's State Department, that we started the negotiations with the Taliban because we were clearly uh, aware of the fact um, that, you know, Americans looked at a 20 year war and thought, why are our sons and daughters still still dying there? So that is, the Biden administration was right on where the sentiment of the American people are. Where I think they're wrong is, is that they thought that this um, just, it, it, it's embarrassing, right? That this, bear, the way uh, the way the withdrawal was conducting, it was embarrassing, it was shameful, and Americans know that. And I think there's a big difference, right? Like, if you go to people on the street and you say, do you think we should have 50,000 troops in Afghanistan? Uh, you're not gonna get very many people that are gonna say yes. But if you ask people if we are there on a train advice and assist mission, uh, if we keep a small number of forces like we've done in Iraq and, and Syria to keep ISIS at bay, to make to make sure that there's not, uh, 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 you know, ISIS is not able to reconstitute, that there is no caliphate, that Al Qaeda obviously cannot reconstitute in Afghanistan and be able to have a homeland from which they can plan attacks on the United States. I think you explain it that way to people, they get it, right? Uh, We're no not doubt. talking about 10,000 troops. We're talking yeah, about survey, you know, uh, a limited that number. Out and, and Senator Ernst, I think, did a good job of, of explaining that, you know, right. the conditions in which you redeploy were essential here. Um, 
yes. the Taliban wasn't complying with the framework that Secretary Pompeo it's true. negotiated. Yeah. So that alone was reason not to do it. And, and certainly um, it's had impact elsewhere. So let, let's move on because yeah. Senator Ernst and others pointed to Afghanistan as a, an example now. It's not only hurting us in terms of the threats you, you just shared with us, counterterrorism, al-Qaeda mm -hmm. from Afghanistan, but also in terms of state actors, Russia exploiting that vulnerability, that sense that there's no deterrence, that the leadership from the United States isn't as strong, or China. China came up repeatedly throughout the forum. Yeah. Uh, you had a conversation with Joe Lonsdale. Uh, he is a newly minted trustee at the Reagan Foundation, mm -hmm. but really has made his name as uh, one of the founders of a Palantir, a tech company that services uh, the military, and now he's a managing partner of a venture capital for an VC. And he focuses a lot on this intersection between technology and national security. Let, let's listen to what he said, because he really kind of yeah. made that connection between tech, national security, and China. I think where China is ironically beating us is they're better at working with their top technologists and top technology companies. And that's really a shame because America is still ahead of China in innovation. We still have a stronger innovation base in our private sector. And you know, when, when we designed how the DOD worked, it was 1961, Robert McNamara, everyone forward. It was very much like a mid 20th century American innovation thing. This is back when hardware was very expensive and all the innovation was around hardware. And, this, and you know, back then in 61, the main economics textbook written by Samuelson showed how the Soviet Union was going to pass America. It was a better model, top town works better. So the whole framework for our DOD is this, innovation's very expansive, everything's centralized, everything's top down. It's very bad at working with dynamic software innovation. So to me, that's the biggest problem, is that innovation oftentimes comes from anywhere. You can have small groups of 10, 20, 50 people somewhere in the economy building something that's really new and really important, and it's almost impossible for them to get into the industrial yeah. innovation base. And so, so that, I, th I think that's the biggest thing, is learning how to work with a world where software innovation comes from anywhere and comes from an open society. So there you are, Morgan, yeah. talking about software in front of an Abrams tank with Joe Lonsdale. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, that was an it's an interesting point about the scene setter there. So first of all, Joe's a very good friend, and I think that he is absolutely brilliant. Um, I love talking to him and getting his perspective. Um, the the one place where I would slightly disagree with Joe, if I'm allowed to do that with the talent, the founder of Palantir, um, is he talked about how the the uh, Chinese uh, government is better at working with their companies. Well, they don't really. It's not an option, right? And it's, it's not like you get a choice in the matter, right? If you actually look at Chinese. Chinese law, uh, the companies, there, there almost is no difference between the state and a private sector company. So when people think about the Chinese government, Chinese companies, they think about, you know, any of our defense companies uh, and U.S. government and the, pro and the interactions, right? And that's just totally fundamentally flawed way to look at um, China, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, because their companies, whether it's a defense company, a technology company, whether it's Huawei, uh, they are compelled by law in China uh, to give that information over to the government. So when you're basically quasi part of the state, it's very easy to work together because you know it's mandated from the from the Communist Party. Uh, what you're going to do. But so what, I sense, I, but what yeah. I sense you saying there, Morgan, just interrupt quickly, not only is that an important distinction, right? That this is, there is no public or private sector. It's just one sector. It's a communist right. party, but also it's almost a disadvantage eventually on their part, right? I mean, because in the end, you don't have this freedom. You don't have this free market. Mm -hmm. And so That's uh, right. the state will impose itself in a way, in artificial ways that won't allow it to kind of optimize perhaps what thing something that can develop organically. I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but. And I think, think, no, I totally agree with you. I don't think that that excuses or negates the other incredibly important point uh, that Joe brought up about uh, the, the need to get more of these startups and more of these new technologies integrated um, into the defense department in a way that's not so bureaucratic and cumbersome. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of creative minds out there that work on this that are more advanced, you know, than I am. But I think it's really important to continue to sound the alarm on this because as Joe said, um, it's it's not that the, that China is somehow more um, ingenuitive than us, more creative, uh, more innovative. Um, they have short term. Um, uh, things that play to their advantage, short-term advantages in the authoritarian nature of the regime and how they interact with the private sector. Um, so we need to reform for sure. There's there's no doubt about it. But I, I agree with you, uh, Roger. I think in the long run, that's, you know, freedom and democracy are always better for the private sector. Yeah. And, you know, one other element that was just kind of ironic with that scene, 
he's talking about software that the Department of Defense has for you know decades been in the business of buying hardware, like the Abrams tank, mm -hmm. which was behind you and Joe. But the future is with software, which of course mm -hmm. is outside of the I industrial base. Are you optimistic that we're going to get the greatest minds and and uh, in, in software, and with that comes artificial intelligence and machine learning, mm -hmm. of course, integrated in Abrams tank or whatever the platform of the future is? I mean, I don't think we have a choice, right? We have to. If we want to remain the world superpower, if we, if we want to, you know, there was a lot of talk by uh, the Secretary of Defense and other administration officials that were present at Reagan Forum um, about competing uh, with China, and, and they use the word competition a, a, a lot. And if we're going to compete, we have to be able to do this stuff. We have to be able to be no, more nimble. I think one of the most important things that you all do at Reagan, Roger, is that you don't um, just have members of the defense community talking to each other, you bring in members of Congress. And I think it's important um, to keep these issues in front of them and to remind them that if we all just, you know, worry about getting the pork for our district and, <laughs> you know, keeping the you know, the plant there and whatever else is going on, um, that might be sustainable for your reelection effort, uh, but it's not sustainable for the long run whenever we're up against a very, very serious adversary. Right. This is not the local national defense forum. It is the yeah. national defense forum to the point you just made, <laughs> you know, yep. one other piece, uh, you, you had so many great discussions and, and folks can go on to our Twitter handle at Reagan Institute to see them. You talk to Congressman Mike Walt, you talk to, uh, Nakasone, as I mentioned earlier, others from, uh, Silicon Valley. But one, the last one I want to highlight is a conversation you had with general David Thompson. He's the vice chief of space operations, bit of a yeah. celebrity because he's the number two yeah. in the space force. And you had a fairly wonky conversation with him about hypersonics, <laughs> not exactly something that's a, uh, kitchen table discussion, although it has been reading the news yeah. Yeah. <laughs> late, right? Um, let's go to this clip and then uh, maybe you could talk about his uh, attempt at explaining hypersonics through, uh, I think, the um, parallel of a snowball. General, one of the things that has been obviously a huge topic of conversation here at the forum is China. Um, and a lot of people who are watching this on social media saw the news about China's hypersonic launch, but they don't really know what to make of it. And there was so much hyperbole in the news. What's the truth? How do Americans make sense of it? So uh, uh, actually, it's, it's sophisticated and complicated when it comes to the technology, but it's not that hard to understand. And, and, and I attribute it to like, um, uh, if you're playing catch, or I know it's Southern California, but if you're in a snowball fight, I know <laughs> Southern Californians don't understand snow. But but if or if I'm throwing a ball, or I'm throwing a snowball, as soon as that ball leaves my hand, anybody understands whether or not that object's coming their way. Mm -hmm. Do I need to try and catch it? Do I need to try and move? But if I throw a ball somewhere else, they instantly know mm -hmm. I don't need to worry about that. Right? right? Uh, ballistic missiles and ballistic missile warning works exactly the same way. The missile launches, it burns out, and you can tell very quickly where is it headed and is it a threat. The problem with the hypersonic is once that happens, you still don't know what's happening to that missile. You know, you think about the snowball or the, or the, the, uh, the baseball. Once it leaves your hand, if it can still maneuver and it might still come back and hit you, you have to watch it the whole time and you never know until it hits the ground whether it's going to be a problem. Same thing with hypersonics. They're always moving, they're always maneuvering. You have to watch it continuously to decide if it's gonna be a problem or a threat. That's why it's such a big challenge. It's no longer, okay, I see it, I capture it, I understand where it's going, I don't need to worry about it. Now I have to watch it the whole time, it can change course, and up until the very last minute, I don't know if it's gonna be a threat. Morgan, what do you think of that? Do you do a good job of explaining hypersonics to you? I thought, I mean, I thought it was very easy to understand. And I think it's important. You know, it, it, one of the things that the general talked about, and I love doing that interview because I am, uh, I've never worked in space before, but I am obsessed with Space Force and with space. I think it's really important. I'm actually kind of bummed that it initially, that the media chose to sort of make fun of us having a Space Force because it is, it is the most prescient and important, I think, part of the of the military right now. I mean, there is a, a, a war going on in space. I mean, you know about it, people who study 
these def defense issues do, but I don't think the average American understands. So I, I think that we should be able to talk about hypersonics. It should be a part of our nomenclature. Um, and one of the things that I'm really passionate about, and I know all of you at Reagan are, is making sure that these issues that we talk about are digestible and relatable to the American people, because we need to understand who our adversary is. We need to understand when the Chinese Communist Party develops technologies that currently evade um, our systems, you know, that our systems can't detect, uh, that means we have homework to do. That means that we need to look at how we're allocating our funding. That means uh, every American uh, has to think carefully about the choices that we make in Congress as it relates to infrastructure spending or healthcare spending or defense spending. Um, and this is why we need to, to go full circle. Uh, we need to be very agile with our taxpayer dollars and getting these innovative uh, young people and startups into the defense process because there, there's no qualms about that you know, with our competitors, right? They'll take the youngest, smartest, brightest people in, don't have to worry about, you know, XYZ district needing a special plant there, right? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's a great point. How do you think we're doing? Because so much of what you do, you're a bit of a translator of sorts, right? You you're, <laughs> you you could play policy like wonk, that. you can have a conversation <laughs> with a, a tech professional like Joe Lonsdale or a four-star general who's responsible for the space domain, but then you, you'll get on The View or on Fox and you're <laughs> trying to translate this yeah. to the American people. I, think I actually China's... did try to get them to talk about hypersonics on The View. I lost that battle, but if they <laughs> invite shocked. me back on, if they <laughs> invite me back on, I found and determined that we're getting a hypersonic segment. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, the United States has exactly zero hypersonic missiles and China's mm -hmm. knocking on a couple of hundred, and we just heard how Wild. this is not simply something that could challenge an ally or friend or even yeah. a four-deployed trooper. This is something that truly threatens the homeland. I mean, so you don't want to scare people, but how are we doing in terms of making these issues something that you know, American people are focusing on? Not just, you know, the, the elites in the media, but the, the average right. person at home or even, you know, our, our CEOs. So I think we're asleep as a nation as it relates to the threat from the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, we were asleep in 2000. We were asleep in two, until on September 10th, uh, 2001, we were asleep about the threat of radical Islam and the threat that it posed to our nation. And unfortunately, it took September 11th for this country to wake up. I will say the good thing is, is when we do wake up, we wake up, we jump right out of bed, and <laughs> we wake right. up with an vengeance, and we attack a problem. Uh, but, you know, the Cold War is a memory uh, for people, you know, that are you know, over Gen X and, and, and above. Um, it's, it's something they remember, but, but it's, it's in the back of their mind, right? We've gone through the, like the global war on terror, our generation, Roger, you know, all of us, either as diplomats or the military or, or what have it, we all served in Iraq and Afghanistan. We've been in, I, I was the last time I was in Kabul, I was pregnant. I remember sort of <laughs> holding onto my belly and thinking, well, this little girl is just going to have a really exciting future for whatever it's headed for her. But our generation, we had, you know, the last 20 years, our focus, uh, we were all shaped by 9-11 uh, happening as, as young adults. So now we're entering this new phase. Um, and I just don't think, I think the American people are catching up when you have, thank God, people like Inez Cantor now, Inez Cantor Freedom, who are talking about the genocide, the ongoing genocide in Xinjiang, uh, China, as it relates to the Uyghurs. I think more and more people, as this, as this permeates pop culture, are learning about it. But do I think the average American understands that the Chinese may have several hundred hypersonics? Absolutely not. Right. So it is your job and it is my job to sound the alarm. It might take an event, right? God forbid. I hope it doesn't. Well, you take want to Taiwan. avoid the crisis or the, or the yeah. tragedy to wake people up, which I know is is the, is the focus a lot of of what you do. I mean, particularly trying yeah. to penetrate. I'm, the I'm John media the Baptist world. on China. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Our, our, uh, our, our, our Jewish communications expert <laughs> acting out as John the Baptist. Beautifully ecumenical there, Morgan. John the Baptist was a Jew. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> um, all right. Well, last question, uh, a little bit yep. more um, on, the, on the lofty side, uh, lighter side. Okay. You, you had a number of these interviews uh, with different backdrops. Uh, the Abrams Ooh. tank we saw, Air Force yeah. One. Give me your cool. best, uh, most kind of uh, exciting uh, space that you want to highlight from your time at the Reagan Library during the Reagan National Defense <sighs> Forum. 
It's got to be Air Force One. I mean, when you, I, I've had the privilege of just flying on it once. It was actually the last flight I took before I had my daughter. I don't think I was supposed to be flying, but it was Air Force One. So I was like, ah, come on, come on, little girl. We're going to have a fun little ride. I've seen her um, pictures on social media. It seems to have worked out. <laughs> She's, she's good. Beautiful. She's fine. She's great. Um, despite the pandemic during her gestation process, she's totally fine. <laughs> so I think the, yeah, Air Force One is, I, I mean, that's one of the reasons also why you have to go, because I think it's as an average American, unless you work in the nerdy stuff that you and I work in in Washington, you're probably not going to have the privilege of seeing Air Force One in person. And at the Reagan Library, um, you can see the replica. And I can tell you that the the smaller version of the plane um, uh, is what the Secretary of State uses. Uh, he, I think he and the Vice President share the fleet, and then you know just the behind the scenes fun stuff. Um, whenever the Vice President gets on the plane, that has his seal, it becomes Air Force Two. And then when the Secretary of State will get on again, the smaller version of the plane has his seal. It's, I guess we don't have a cool code name, but it's the Secretary of State's plane. But it still has that United States of America that you see on Air Force One, which is iconic and amazing. And every time I used to walk up to that plane, I remember the very first trip I took with Pompeo. I looked at the plane and I thought this will be over before you know it. So don't ever take it for granted. Enjoy every moment. And I always tried to stop before I got on the plane and stare at it and take a mental picture and and just remember how grateful I was to work um, for the American people at the State Department to represent them. And I think it's just breathtaking seeing Air Force One at the Reagan Library. And I highly, highly recommend that, well, that all of that our was the Air viewers Force and One listeners go. That, that President Reagan flew and-, and So uh, cool. Oh, wait, wait, the, is it his actual plane? That is the plane that I he thought flew it was a replica. throughout his eight years in their presidency. Oh yeah, my no, God. Well, that's even deal. cooler. Yeah, it's even cooler. That's but really but cool. to your point, you know, I always think of it, those are the wings of freedom. And, and Morgan, we thank oh. you for your service because you gave voice um, to those to those wings throughout all your travels with Secretary of State Pompeo and your okay. time in government. Morgan Ortegas, thank you for joining us on this special episode of Reaganism, talking about the Reagan National Defense Forum. Check out her work uh, at our Twitter handle, at Reagan Institute, where you can see all of her interviews for the Reagan National Defense Forum live program. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you, Roger. Appreciate it. If you enjoyed the conversation, make sure to subscribe to Reaganism wherever you listen to podcasts. To watch this episode in video form, please go to youtube.com slash Reagan Foundation. Thanks for listening.